One, one, two, three, four. What is up, y'all? It's your boy Charles. Charles on there as well, checking in. Listen, we are about to get into the book Diary of a Mad Band by Scarface. It's a really good audio book. Y'all can check it out on Audible. We're going to get into uh, this part. It's a chapter where Scarface pretty much realizes that rap a lot ain't paying them. Let's go ahead and get into it, guys. The thumbs up button. And let's go ahead and get into the story. I'll come back now with the after. it. Nothing was ever good enough. No matter how many records I sold, or how much my name started to ring out as one of the best to ever do it, I was never able to meet Jay's expectations for me. There was never any praise or any kind of bonus for outstanding performance, or none of that shit. I couldn't even get a simple good job. Instead, all I ever got was, you ain't working hard enough. Even to this day. I've never gotten a single phone call complimenting me on my records or my performance. Nothing. I'm not saying I needed a trophy or anything, but I was putting in work. The only way I knew if something was good or not was if Big Mellow was fucking with it. Big Mellow, Curtis, was a seriously funny dude. I'd met him back when we used to catch the 33 Post Oak together on the south side. I was in middle school then, but he was a little older, and I used to work at this little juice spot, making juices and shakes and shit. He was big into music too, and we'd ride the bus rapping and beatboxing to each other. Once I got on, I brought him over to rap a lot, and over the years we stayed tight. Mello was a Scarface fan. If he told me my shit was jamming, then I knew I had something. And that went for all of the niggas around my way. The minute I got word that Southside was fucking with some shit I'd done, I knew I was good. And it had always been that way with me. From day one, I always wanted to have the most jamming shit in the hood. I couldn't get shit for praise from the record company. But if the niggas in the neighborhood co-signed me, at least I had that. Well, the niggas around the way were definitely fucking with The Untouchable when it came out. It seemed like everybody was. We sent Smile to radio in early 97, just a few months after Pac's death. And the song was so striking, and everyone was still so sad to see Pac go, that it quickly became a hit. It didn't crack the top 10. It topped out at number 12. But it went gold and is still the biggest single I ever released. When The Untouchable arrived in March, the people were ready. With Smile working at radio and my reputation for quality music secure in the streets, The Untouchable debuted at the top of the Billboard 200, pushing U2's pop down to number two. I was 26 years old and I had the number one album in the country. I was always much more concerned about the money than the charts, but still, I was all over the radio, and my album was everywhere. It was the one time that I didn't need anyone at the label to call and tell me that shit worked. The success of The Untouchable was undeniable. Almost as soon as The Untouchable dropped, we started plotting my next album. It was the first time we planned a release ahead of time, and even though I usually didn't work like that, this was one plan I could get behind. From day one, the plan was to get me paid. rap -a -Lot had just negotiated a new deal with Virgin, shifting distribution from Virgin subsidiary New Tribe Records to Virgin Proper. And the talk around the label was that the new deal meant more exposure and more bread. The biggest check I'd ever seen from rap -a -Lot was a $400,000 royalty check after the diary went platinum. And I'd had to pay that shit back for management or publishing or some shit that the label controlled. I'm not even sure what. So you know I was ready to cash in. From the beginning, I wanted to do exactly what Dr. Dre had done with The Chronic. Produce a bunch of incredible beats, pair them with a bunch of dope ass MCs, maybe add a verse here or there, and really showcase what I can do behind the boards. It was the ideal situation for me. I was already making a ton of beats, and the MCs weren't a problem. The label was stacked, and with a lot of talent, like AG2A Key and the whole face mob, that I brought through the door. 
And I knew guys like Ice Cube and Too Short would be down when they got the call. Well shit, I was jamming so hard and the records were coming together so quickly that we decided to make that motherfucker a double album. Pac and Biggie had both won with double albums and we figured shit, I could carry one too. The album took less than a year to put together and everyone was excited about it, me most of all. I called it my homies. Unfortunately, when it came time to release the album, shit didn't go quite as planned. Not even close. First off, I wasn't feeling the single. Now, the way shit would go at rap a lot when you turned the records in, your workday was done, and you could never be 100% sure that the album that you turned in would be the album that would appear in stores. Sometimes you turn shit in one way, and then go to buy the album, and there'd be shit on there that you'd never heard. A new singer on one record, or a new verse by someone else on another, you name it. There was always some shit going on or being added in at the last minute. You'd hear that shit, and it'd be like somebody went in your sock drawer and put their feet in your socks, or their ass in your underwear or some shit. It was disgusting. But the label was in control. And if you got pissed off and tried to address it, you might not be able to get a check. Or Jay would stop answering the phone, and next thing you know, five or ten years would go by, and you'd be like, damn, I never got paid for that shit at all. <laughs> and that's pretty much what happened with the lead single from my homies, Homies and Thugs. First and foremost, it was Jay's idea to get Master P and me together on a record. Now, nothing personal against P, but I didn't want him on the album. I didn't give a fuck that P was on fire. It just felt like jumping on what was hot to sell a record. And I've never been into that whole let me find out who's hot and get them on my album or jump on one of their songs approach. I'm not breaking my neck to get in the studio with someone just so I can ride his wave. That shit has always been corny to me. So when P came through, it was all love because P's my dog. But it wasn't a big deal to me that we get a song done together. Sure, he was hot and he had sold all of these millions of records, but I'm face. He was doing him, and I was doing me. And I didn't feel like I needed his help to sell my project. Shit, I'd made it this far. I'd be good on my own. Then Jay wanted to put that Pac verse on there, too. And that shit was just a complete failure to me. It wasn't like we had some crispy, never-before-heard verse from Pac that was cut in the booth and mixed and mastered and all of that shit. Nah. We had some video footage of Pac freestyling that my cousin had shot while we were all hanging out, bullshitting and drinking in the studio during the smile session. We had to hunt my cousin down to get that footage. It was that bad. And I was just watching all of this happen like, fuck man, this is some bottom of the barrel shit if I've ever seen it. Taking a dead man's vocals off of a videotape to use it in a song? That's the lowest of the low. I know Pac probably flipped over in his grave when he heard that shit. I thought the record was a fuck up from Jump. If it had been up to me, I would have left homies and thugs off the album. But it wasn't my call. And I could say, I don't want to do this or don't put that song on my album all I wanted. But when it came down to it, Jay was going to do what Jay was going to do. And there wasn't shit to do but accept it. But that was Jay just being way ahead of me again. He knew that P was that hot, and that the fans didn't care about the quality of the Pac verse. They just wanted more Pac. The song wasn't a runaway hit, but it did pretty well at radio, and let everyone know that there was a new Scarface album on the shelf. Still, I thought that whole shit was disastrous. I wasn't trying to sell my shit like that. Not with Master P and a piss-poor recording of a pop verse. I wasn't looking for that kind of help. And I definitely didn't think that song was a highlight of the album. If I had been picking singles, I would have gone with the UGK and 3-2 record, Too Real, or The Ghetto, with me, Willie D, and Ice Cube. Those were the standout records to me. Putting out homies and thugs felt like tying a 45-pound weight to my reputation and throwing it in the river just to see if it would sink. Those kinds of moves can destroy your career. Luckily, I was able to float on past it. My homies came out in March 1998, 
had hit number four on the Billboard chart. It was platinum within a month of release. The way I was looking at it, I'm thinking $8 a record for a million records sold was going to be mine. My big payday was finally here, right? Eight times one million is easy math. Wrong. The crop didn't come in that year, boss. The crop never came in. I didn't see shit approaching $8 million off of that album. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, when it was all said and done, I think I got one $120,000 check. And that check went right back to management before the ink ever had a chance to dry. That's what finally pushed me to the point of feeling like, fuck this. For years, I'd gone back to back to back, busting my ass to make quality music and put out quality albums. But after a decade with the label, I'd sold over 4 million albums on my own, plus another 2 plus million with the Ghetto Boys, and I still didn't really have shit to show for it. No matter how many gold or platinum albums I put out, the label wasn't breaking any bread with me. And this was from day one. Oh man, so... Damn, it took 10 years for Scarface to make real money? Even though he was with Rap a lot, one of the biggest conglomerates in the world. But well, as far as like record labels in the South, it was the biggest, especially at that time. Damn, it took him 10 years to get paid. Wow. Man, I wonder why. Uh, so I guess, I guess Little J, J Prince, we call him Little J. I guess he, I guess he uh, ran a type ship at Rap a lot. He didn't want to give up that paper. You know what I'm saying? But dang, 10 years. And he had all those hits with, with uh, Tupac and Ice Cube and uh, Die of a Madman, and he wasn't getting paid. He said he only seen like a hundred and some thousand dollars from that album, that last album he did with Smile on it, which was a huge hit. Especially after Tupac passed away is when that album came out, and that song was every freaking where, man. Like even in Florida, like they was playing that song every hour on the hour. But man, that rap game, man, the record label. The record company, the record times, hip hop times, all that stuff, man, back in those days was shady. Anyway, what do y'all think about that, man? That video? Leave your comments, subscribe to Charles and Israel. That thumbs up button.